earlier when we discussed the Second Great Awakening, we talked about how there were a lot of reform movements that sort of arose out of that religious movement. And there were, there were quite a few uh, throughout the, uh, particularly starting in the 1820s through the uh, 1840s and 50s. Um, and we're going to look at several of them. First, we'll look at this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said in 1841, in the history of the world, the doctrine of reform has never such hope as at the present time. So a lot of different areas, like I said, abolition, we've already talked about. The temperance movement, which was the movement to, uh, uh, to make uh, alcohol illegal. Temperance is kind of a weird term for that because temperance means, you know, having some, uh, some balance. Uh, but the temperance movement, uh, women's suffrage or the right to vote, which was more broadly a part of a, an early uh, version of the feminist movement. So women's rights, uh, reform in education, reform in institutions like uh, poorhouses, insane asylums, and prisons. We'll talk for a moment about the, uh, the prison reform right now. We'll touch on the others. Prisons had always been a place where criminals were put to punish them as a deterrent to future criminals. Don't, uh, don't commit crimes because you don't want to be locked up in prison. It was also a way to uh, remove dangerous uh, people from the general population. But during this time period, there started to be a move toward rehabilitation, re-education of criminals, uh, so that the prison could be a place not just for them to be punished or locked away, but for them to be taught a new way of doing things so that when they were released, they would not uh, be victims of recidivism or, in other words, not go right back to their criminal ways. Be rehabilitated. And this new type of prison that originated in the United States with a view toward rehabilitation was called a penitentiary. And that comes from the word penitent, which means repentant. So, you know, if you paid attention in, uh, in Sunday school, repent doesn't just mean to be sorry. It comes from a Greek word that means to turn around. So to repent is to be sorry and also stop doing what you're doing and do something different instead. Uh, so that was the hope that people who went to a penitentiary would in fact repent and become rehabilitated. So, you know, when... Uh, uh, you get together at Thanksgiving and the family talks about how Uncle Bob is in the pen again. Um, hopefully he will repent because that's what they were designed for. You recall a couple of times we've talked about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was that French writer who was sent uh, basically by the French government to investigate and examine these American penitentiaries to see how the system worked and see whether he wanted to recommend it to the French government, but he actually turned that into the book, Democracy in America. All right, so um, prison reform, uh, temperance. The temperance movement really got underway during the Second Great Awakening, and it was a couple of the most prominent preachers of the Second Great Awakening that kicked that movement off. Lyman Beecher, whom we discussed earlier, um, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Charles Finney, whom we discussed even earlier still, uh, who was the, uh, the preacher in New York, uh, New York State, who was associated with the Burned Over District in, in New York, where there were so many converts. So these two individuals started preaching sermons about the uh, evils of alcohol and how it should be done away with completely and kind of kicked off a movement a movement that would get more momentum after the Civil War and really toward the end of the century. So uh, we will table that one and discuss it in more detail later. But now, let's look at some, uh, some people who were involved in the abolitionist movement who also happened to be uh, female human beings. Um, and, and as we will see, there's a lot of crossover uh, between abolitionism and women's suffrage among uh, 
among these women. So uh, first one we'll look at is Abby Kelly, later Abby Kelly Foster from Massachusetts. She was, uh, uh, actually she was uh, invested uh, pretty deeply uh, at first in the, uh, the health teachings of Sylvester Graham. Remember him and his, his wacky crackers. Uh, but then she heard a speech by Lyman Beecher about uh, the, uh, the terrors of slavery, and she became a staunch and fervent abolitionist. She started volunteering. Uh, she started organizing female auxiliary uh, branches of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and she started giving speeches. She was a remarkably gifted orator. Speeches to women's groups. But then she started giving speeches to mixed groups, men and women, and that was a bit scandalous for some people. Um, she also promoted uh, women's rights and pacifism. In fact, uh, she became closely associated with uh, William Lloyd Garrison and uh, worked closely with him, and their branch of the American Anti-Slavery Society uh, was geared not just toward gaining the abolition of slavery, but also desegregation. Not only to free the slaves, but to give black people equal rights to white people, and also to be pacifists, uh, completely pacifistic uh, when it came to uh, um, any kind of involvement in, in war, even in a peripheral way. And they came to be considered the radical element of the American Anti-Slavery Society, uh, with the Tappan brothers being uh, leaders of the more conservative element. And eventually, Abby Kelly was voted onto the board of that American Anti-Slavery Society. And about half the members of the organization quit in protest, including the Tappan brothers. Quit and went off and formed an alternative boys-only abolition society. Also from Massachusetts, Lucy Coleman, who lived a very long life, uh, I think 88 years old. Um, is, that, is that correct? Uh, 82, yeah, 88 years. Um, so her life spanned almost the entire women's suffrage movement. She passed away about 14 years before it finally came to fruition. She was right there at the beginning when it started. Uh, so not only women's suffrage, meaning women's right to vote, but also abolition, desegregation in northern cities. Uh, also the opposition to capital punishment, which a lot of the radical abolitionists started doing, uh, and to the, to the extent that by the 1850s, a handful of northern states had done away with capital punishment. After 1852, she was a speaker in defense of atheism. That was after the death of her child, which kind of destroyed her, her faith. Uh, and uh, you know, how could there be a loving God? And so she was very outspoken about atheism and was a uh, founding member of the New York State Free Thinkers Association. So fascinating life that she had. Also, the Grimke Sisters of South Carolina, white Southerners, white Southerners, and in fact, daughters of a slave owner, a plantation owner who was also a judge. Uh, judge Grimke had a huge plantation with uh, um, over a hundred slaves, but his daughters hated slavery. Um, Angelina, from a young age, hated slavery. After when she was five years old, she saw a slave being whipped, which was very brutal. And little five-year-old Angelina ran away from home because she wanted to go somewhere that there was no slavery. Um, also, they were disenchanted when they learned that their father had actually fathered children by his slaves so that they actually had siblings who'd been sold away and were in bondage. And their older brother also had fathered children by his slave. Uh, the, uh, the sisters actually uh, tracked down those three children of their brother uh, and uh, paid for their education and paid to free them. Well, uh, they were an embarrassment to Dad because Dad was very pro-slavery. 
Um, Angelina accompanied her father to Philadelphia because he had some serious health problems and there was a specialist up there. Uh, and they stayed there for a while, and that's where she met the Quakers and converted to becoming a Quaker. And then when she got back home to South Carolina, was even more outspoken, and their sister uh, Sarah uh, came along with her in that. And um, they both became very prominent speakers and writers on the subject of abolition, which was not a popular subject in the South. They from the beginning were against colonization. They were against freeing the slaves only to send them to Africa. Um, Angelina said, quote, since I engaged in the investigation of the rights of the slave, I have necessarily been led to a better understanding of my own. And this was a common phenomenon. Women who got involved in the abolitionist movement fighting uh, vociferously for the rights of black men and women, came to understand that they had rights too that were not being recognized. So they also were early feminists. Angelina Grimke's most famous work was An Appeal to the Women of the South in 1836. And she had kind of a, uh, a feud with Catherine Beecher, the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Catherine Beecher was the educator who introduced the uh, German idea of kindergarten to America. Uh, But Beecher believed that women should always be subordinate to men. Women should not take the lead. Women should not be outspoken. Uh, Women should be quiet supporters of the men doing these things. And uh, Angelina Grimke was not about that at all. In fact, she was so much not about that that it caused problems with her Quakerism uh, because she was a little too outspoken for a Quaker, and she wound up being uh, kicked out of that religion. Uh, She also argued with Catherine Beecher about the idea of colonization. So Grimke sisters, very important. Eventually, Eventually, as it got harder to be abolitionists in the South after Nat Turner's rebellion, they moved to the North. All right, some other uh, types of reform included uh, reform of mental institutions. And the way uh, toward that was led by um, an educator named Dorothea Dix, who uh, kind of on her own initiative examined several mental institutions. And basically mental institutions were just prisons for uh, uh, people with mental problems. They would just be locked away out of sight and left there and mistreated horribly. She advocated for more humane uh, treatment for the mentally ill, uh, and several reforms were passed. Later on, during the uh, Civil War, she was the superintendent of nurses for the, uh, the Union Army. Another uh, individual to mention here is Lydia Finney. That's her in the upper right. The daughter, I mean, not daughter, the wife of Charles Finney, the great, second great awakening preacher. She was the uh, founder and leader of an organization called the Female Moral Reform Society, uh, established in New York City in 1834, dedicated to redeeming prostitutes, to saving prostitutes from, uh, from a life of prostitution. Uh, the uh, uh, general consensus of the uh, women in this reform society was that uh, these these women who were prostitutes, uh, it was often through no fault of their own. They were sort of forced into this untenable situation. Many of them were rural girls who moved to the city to get uh, jobs and then got no jobs because there were not that many jobs open during the Industrial Revolution in New York City for for women. And so uh, their only option to survive was to turn to prostitution. So they didn't seek to, uh, they didn't seek to humiliate or embarrass the women who were prostitutes. They instead sought to humiliate and embarrass the men who used them. So they would regularly check in with police departments and find out, 
uh, get the arrest lists that were public, uh, publicly available if you asked for them and find the names of all the men who'd been arrested for visiting the prostitutes or for assaulting women and would publish them in lists and post them all over town to, uh, to embarrass those men. So this, uh, this emphasis on reform during this time period really uh, ties into a couple of things that we've talked about. It ties into the wheel of respectability, uh, that middle class concept of controlling your emotions. So there was this belief among reformers that criminals, mentally ill people, or quote unquote lunatics, um, people who use prostitutes, all of them needed to be taught self-control. Self-control, the paramount thing in Victorian uh, America and England. And also the influence of the Second Great Awakening, specifically perfectionism. That idea that if you improve human society enough, it will reach the point that God's kingdom will be established and Christ shall return to reign once more. And so, therefore, participating in reform movements to try to improve life for uh, for uh, people in various uh, bad situations, social justice, in other words, could actually bring about God's kingdom. All right, well, some other uh, individuals to talk about here, particularly in the uh, women's suffrage movement. These three ladies, kind of like the big three uh, in this early, uh, early part of that movement, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Now, Mott and Stanton organized the very first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Susan B. Anthony wasn't there. She didn't join the movement until 1851. Uh, but then the three of them were the kind of the leaders of that movement after she, she joined and became active. But right now it is Mott um, who's on the Mott on the left and Stanton on the right. They had become friends back in 1840 because they were abolitionists and they had traveled with a group of abolitionists to London for an international conference on abolishing slavery. They traveled with their husbands and several other men. They were the two women in the group. Um, and they came, <clears throat> their, their purpose in, in coming in part was to present a, uh, a proposal to the, uh, uh, the assembly there uh, to allow women to be more actively involved in the movement, which they knew was going to be controversial. What they didn't realize was it was so controversial they would not be allowed in. They were allowed to sit in the gallery uh, and watch the proceedings, but not to come down to the floor and be a part of them, nor were they allowed to speak or to vote, and they got pretty ticked off about that uh, and realized that abolition of slavery wasn't the only issue they wanted to work on. They wanted to try to get equal rights for women. And so that was kind of the kickoff of, of a major movement. And another, another important uh, figure in the, uh, uh, the women's suffrage movement was an ex-slave named Sojourner Truth who uh, gave a very powerful speech at uh, a women's rights conference in Akron, Ohio, in 1851. Ain't I a Woman was the, the name of, of the speech, and it was, uh, it was captured uh, in notes by reporters uh, who then uh, published the speech, and it appeared in newspapers around the country. And we really ought to... Uh, we really ought to give this speech a listen. <laughs> 
What they call it? Intellect. That's it, honey. <laughs> what that got to do with a woman's rights or a Negro's rights? If my little cup won't hold but a pint and yours hold a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then, that man there, that night there, that little man in black that he said, women can't have rights as much as men cause Christ wasn't a woman. <laughs> Where did your Christ come from? <laughs> One more woman I want to talk about is Amelia Bloomer, also an early feminist. She was, in fact, at that Seneca Falls conference. And Amelia Bloomer believed that Victorian dress, the way that women were expected to, to dress in order to be proper, was in itself constricting both physically and metaphorically that it was repressive of women. And if you're familiar with this at all, you know, women had to wear these, uh, all these petticoats and bustles, layers and layers and corsets that were pulled so tight that sometimes the women would pass out. Uh, and uh, Amelia Bloomer called for, called for a change there, for women to be liberated from corsets and bustles, basically. And she wanted to know why women in the Western world couldn't dress the way women do in Turkey, with long, flowing, loose-fitting, and comfortable clothing, like this Turkish woman uh, from the uh, from the 19th century. And uh, so uh, she called for for this type of clothing, and in particular, uh, these light bloused pantaloons. This uh, this picture is a uh, not a woman in Turkey, but a woman in the United States who is uh, um, following this, this new fashion that Amelia Bloomer tried to get started. It uh, didn't really stick, but one thing that did, that did stick from it was the, uh, the bloused pantaloons, which came to be called bloomers. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with that word. My grandma used to use it a lot. Ah, don't you go getting, getting your bloomers all twisted. Uh, so anyway... Uh, like I said, this this was uh, an effort that didn't succeed. It was kind of a fad for a while uh, with with feminists in the 1840s, and uh, it was uh, it was made fun of by by men, including men in the abolitionist movement. Uh, and this is a, a cartoon from a, a newspaper at the time. Hello, Turks in Gotham. Mrs. Turkey, it says, having attended Mrs. Oak Smith's lecture on emancipation dress resolves at once to give a start to the new fashion and in order to do it with more effect she wants mr turkey to join her in this bold attempt so this is a uh, caricature it's a satire right so it's it's saying uh, she's making her poor husband dress in this outlandish garb too and he weakly is allowing this to happen why uh, this uh, emancipation of women is going to equal the emasculation of men, they believed. And I tend to think that it's a good thing they weren't around a couple of generations later to see how women were dressing by the end of World War I when they were showing their shoulders and ankles and everything, dear God. Anyway, that's the origin of bloomers. <laughs> 